We like to think we're so technologically advanced, but I've never known a hymnal that stalled out in the middle of a song. <laughs> so maybe we should just go back, man. <clears throat> Great to be with you this morning. Today we're going to be talking about the discipleship plan. The discipleship plan. Before we do, let's pray together. Father, we just thank you again for your love for us through Jesus Christ, which has saved us, which has forgiven us, which has changed us. God and is changing us, God, up to this very moment, up to this very day. And so, Lord, we cling to that hope that he uh, who began a good work in us will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus, Lord. So, Leave us not alone, God. Continue to work in us by your spirit. Fill us with hope. The hope that we have, that we rest on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ. Fill us with courage to stand for you, Lord. To be willing to suffer for you, if necessary. So that all your sheep, Lord, may be brought into your fold. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And as you do, I just want to kind of have you consider how miraculous it is that we, in 2021, worship a man who lived 2,000 years ago. A man who only lived to his mid-30s. If you think about it, it's, it's pretty strange that that's the case. 2,000 years, thousands of miles away, we worship a man. Now, of course, we worship him because we believe that he was a man, but that he was more than a man. The man, the son of God, the fulfillment of every promise of God, the solution to man's greatest problem. Our sin and separation and alienation from God. We could, but, you see, we, we take that for granted. But we just cannot, I just think we cannot forget how amazing that it is that we stand here in Eastman, Georgia in 2021 worshiping Jesus Christ. Think about how many people lived and died in this world that are utterly and completely forgotten. And yet here we have Jesus Christ who lived 2,000 years ago in an obscure part of the Roman Empire. He only lived to his mid-30s, and we worship him as Lord and King. How did that happen? How can that happen? The answer is God's discipleship plan. That's how it happened. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. And so if you have a Bible and you're able and willing, I invite you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. We're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. Paul, writing to Timothy, says, You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal. But the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The word of God you may be seated. So this morning we're going to talk about the discipleship plan um, under three headings this morning. We're going to talk about passing on the treasure. Number two, playing by the rules. And number three, persevering for the elect. Passing on the treasure, playing by the rules, and persevering 
for the elect. First, we're going to talk about passing on the treasure. Okay, This passage in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy is one of my favorite books. This is one of my favorite passages. It's certainly one of the most important passages as we consider the mission of the church and how it is that the disciple-making mission of the church concretely gets fulfilled. The book of 2 Timothy, we can say, is itself a fulfillment of the, the very thing which it teaches. Because the book of 2 Timothy is Paul himself is an act of discipleship. Paul is discipling Timothy by writing to him this letter. And it is, uh, it is teaching and instructing Timothy about how Timothy should teach and instruct others. So it is a how-to manual, both in its content and in its example, about how we should make disciples. So uh, the, it's understood that 2 Timothy is the last letter Paul ever wrote. He was in his, his, his final imprisonment uh, sh shortly before he would be, as tradition says, beheaded by the Roman government for his witness and testimony to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, You then, my child, there in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul asserts his eternal familial relationship that the gospel has created between he and Timothy. Okay, Though they're not biologically related and that Timothy is a grown man, Paul calls him his child. He's still Paul's child. Why? How? Because Paul was instrumental in Timothy's spiritual upbringing. And the gospel gives us family deeper and longer lasting than blood relationships. And so Paul then, as a spiritual father, feels in a special burden to ensure the uh, and to take care of the spiritual instruction and upbringing and guidance of his children, like any good parent does and should. And that is what, by the way, discipleship is. It is spiritual upbringing. It's spiritual rearing. It's spiritual training and instruction of the next generation so that they can faithfully pass on what we ourselves received and preserved. It is the older generation intentionally taking up its spiritual riches and entrusting it to the next generation so that they can then take that same truth and build upon the gains that our generation has made so that the, the true and pure gospel can carry forward into the next generation. If at any point a generation abdicates its responsibility to teach and, and train and instruct the next generation, we're in big trouble. That's part of the reason why this country is in the mess that it is. Because people have not taken responsibility saying it's not, their, it's not the government's responsibility, it's not their responsibility, it's my responsibility to ensure that my children are trained in the instruction and admonition of the Lord. It doesn't matter if they get a good education if they don't love Jesus and act with integrity and live with holiness in public and in private. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Nothing can compare to that. But that's just. But even that's just in, in physical family. We're talking about spiritual family here. Every Christian generation has a responsibility to teach and instruct and train the next generation so that that generation will then have the strength and the know-how and the courage and the conviction to pass the gospel on to the next generation. Why? Because in any given generation, the church is only at that point one generation away from extinction. If, if a single generation fails to pass on the gospel, we fail. For 2,000 years, the church of Jesus Christ has faithfully passed on the gospel, which is the only reason why we can stand here today forgiven of our sins, because previous generations did not shirk their responsibility. That's the only reason why we're saved today. And so we, have that, we take up the mantle of that same responsibility today. Paul tells Timothy in verse 1, Be strengthened, you then my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul knows that Timothy is going to need strength. If you read Paul's letters to Timothy, we don't know. It seems that Timothy might have been kind of a timid guy, which many, you know, many people have that kind of personality. And he needed strength. He needed encouragement. And so he, he, he tells Timothy, Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus to fulfill the mission that God has trusted to us is we're going to need strength. Discipleship requires strength. Discipleship requires divine power. It's something that we can't do on our own. God has given it 
to us, the gospel to us, to pass it on to the next generation. Now, disciple making may sound intimidating to you because you feel that it is beyond you. But just, you know, but let's, rem let's remind ourselves of this fact, that waking up in the morning is beyond us. If you woke up in the morning, it's because you woke up with the strength that was provided to you by the grace of God. Let us never forget that there were people who thought they were going to wake up this morning, and they didn't. Why did you wake up this morning? Because of God's grace. That's why. Be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The strength of God is what? It's grace. It's a gift. You do, no, we don't have the strength. We don't have the strength to do this. That's why what? We need it as a gift from God. But that's precisely why what? God gives it to us, right? God gives us his unbelievable supernatural strength, right? And so, and so we just have to remember and we have to keep things in perspective, right? We have to keep it ever before our eyes. You see, we take it for granted that God's going to give us the strength to wake up tomorrow morning. But why do we not have the same faith that he's going to give us the strength to make disciples tomorrow? Oh, you know, he feeds the birds of the air. He clothes the lilies of the field. Will he not much more feed you and clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? He strengthened you to wake up in the morning. He strengthened you to do everything else that you do. Do you not think he is going to strengthen you to make disciples, O oh, you of little faith? He will. He can. All his strength is just ready, willing to be poured out on us when we cast our needy selves down at the foot of his throne of grace. He's a generous father. He'll give us more than we could ask for when we call upon him for strength. And I mean, and what greater thing? What greater thing that could, can we possibly come to God and ask for strength for than to say, Lord Jesus, I want your help to serve you. I want your help to glorify you. I want your help to make disciples. He's going to help us. We need the strength of God. It's a gift of grace, and he is a gracious God. Then Paul tells, gives Timothy the plan, the discipleship plan. It says, it's so simple. It's so simple. It's just, it's amazing. Here it is. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's it. One sentence. That's the plan. That's it. If somebody asked you, what's the plan of your life? How would you explain it? Probably be more than one sentence. This is one sentence. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, instruct to faithful men who will be, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's it. That's the plan. And if you look at it, you'll notice something remarkable. In this one sentence, there are four generations encapsulated in this one sentence. Four generations. You have Paul. That's the first generation. First generation Christian, apostle, met Jesus Christ himself on the road to Damascus. First generation. Then you have Timothy. That's the second generation. Paul is writing to Timothy, instructing him about what he should do, teaching him about what he should do. So you have Paul, you have Timothy. Then you have the third generation. He tells Timothy, Timothy, what I've told you, take that same thing and entrust it to faithful men, faithful people, okay? So that's the third generation, right? But then, not just that, there's one more. And then he says, entrust it to faithful men. Who will then go and teach it to others also? That's generation number four. Okay? That's the fourth generation. So what is Paul concerned about here? Paul is concerned about his spiritual great-grandchildren. You concerned about your children? You concerned about your grandchildren? You concerned about your great-grandchildren? Well, what are we going to do about it? Paul had this burden, and he had to leave it with Timothy. And he says, Timothy, Timothy, you are the plan. I have entrusted to you what has been entrusted to me. Now you need to go entrust it to somebody else. And make sure when you entrust it to them that they know that they must then go and entrust it to somebody else too. Why? Because Paul is taking responsibility for his spiritual great-grandchildren, right? This is the mission of our church. To be concerned not merely for ourselves, but our spiritual great-grandchildren, teaching, training, charging the next generation to do the same. When Paul uses this language of entrust, he says, 
and trust the faithful men. He's actually picking up on language that he's already used earlier in the letter, just a few verses before that in in chapter 1. Okay, In chapter 1, verse 12, Paul says, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard into that day what has been entrusted to me. Okay? So Paul says that he's not ashamed of the gospel. He's in prison. He's not ashamed of being in prison for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he's not afraid about what's going to happen because he knows that God is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. Now think about that statement. God is going to, God has entrusted something to Paul, right? He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about the core truths of the church, the central teaching of the church. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead for the forgiveness of sins. Okay? God has entrusted that to Paul, and Paul believes that, that God is able to guard that until that day. In my Bible, the word day is translated with a capital D. Okay? You're probably talking about the, the day of Christ Jesus, the day of Christ's return. Well, guess what? It's been 2,000 years, and the gospel's still going strong. Paul's, Paul's confidence in God was not misplaced. The gospel is still going strong. But still, he said that God is able to guard what was entrusted to me. And then two verses later there in verse 14 of chapter 1, Paul then tells Timothy, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. And so think about the connection there between those two verses, verse 12 and verse 14. In verse 12, Paul says that God is able to guard it, right? God is able to guard what has been entrusted to me. Then in verse 14, he tells Timothy to do what? By the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, you guard the good deposit entrusted to you. So so who is it? Does God guard it or does Timothy guard it? Who? Who? What's the answer? Both. God guards the deposit through Timothy. How? By his Holy Spirit. So when you say, so when we say, how does God guard the gospel? How does God ensure? We can say God is going to ensure that his gospel is going to remain pure to the end of time, right? God, but how is God going to do that? Is he just going to snap his fingers? No, he's going to do it through his people, by the Holy Spirit who lives within them. In other words, God uses means to accomplish his end. Just because God does something doesn't mean that he doesn't use means to accomplish his end. When a carpenter uses a hammer to hammer a nail, does the carpenter hammer the nail or does the hammer hammer the nail? If just because the hammer is the actual tool that, that hit the nail, does that mean the carpenter didn't do it? So what does it mean? It means God is going to do what God is going to do, but guess what? He's going to use you to do it. If you have the Holy Spirit of God living within you. Guard the good deposit, he tells Timothy, which has been entrusted to you. I love that language. It's been entrusted. It's been handed down. It's been handed over. The gospel is the church's treasure. The gospel is the church's pearl of great price. It is that which is more precious than anything in all the world. If we lose the gospel, we lose everything. If a church loses the pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ, it ceases to be a church. This world is full of churches that aren't churches. Because they lost the gospel. If we lose the gospel, we'll lose everything. Nevertheless, God is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to us. And he's going to do that through his people. Which is, and so this, this, is why, this is why one of the most common, the, one of the most commonly repeated warnings is the new, in the New Testament is the warning against false teachers. Why? Because the devil is out there to steal, kill, and destroy. And one of the... <clears throat> When the easiest way, I mean, when the when his greatest tricks is counterfeits, right? If you if you if you've been sold a counterfeit, you don't realize you're missing the real thing. That's what makes it even more dangerous, right? It's not that you don't even know that you lost it. 
because you believe in a false one. Okay? So we have, a, we have a, a pure treasure given to the church, and we must pass it on. So we have that responsibility to teach it to others and then train and teach those to then pass it on to still more. That's the plan. That's the discipleship plan. That's how we stand here 2,000 years after Jesus Christ rose from the dead, worshiping him as Lord, because others have passed on the treasure. And we must pass it on to you. So number one, we pass on the treasure. Number two, we must play by the rules, playing by the rules. He says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. It is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding and everything. So here, we, we, we pass on the treasure, but then Paul uses several metaphors, several metaphors to explain to us how we are to pass on the treasure. There's a manner in which we are to go about the work that we do as Christians. The first thing he says is he says, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. This is a military metaphor. Okay, and the analogy, don't let it confuse you, okay? The analogy is one not of violence, but it's one of focus on mission and endurance of suffering, okay? Our enemies, as the church of Jesus Christ, are not flesh and blood. We don't war against people. You realize that, right? So when you, so when you, so just remember, that when you turn on the news, people are railing against other people. People are aggravated by other people. Our enemy, as the church of Jesus Christ, our enemy is not people. Our enemy is not flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6. The devil is a formidable foe, and the battle will be fierce. That's what the military metaphor is about. We wage war against the devil. The devil lurks around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Okay? And so, there, and so what that, the war analogy means then is that, the, the, that following Jesus Christ is going to involve suffering because you don't enter into battle without receiving some blows, without taking some wounds. Following Jesus most of the time is going to be a, lead to a harder life, not an easier one. And Paul wants Timothy to have no illusions about this. If Jesus Christ suffered then you're going to suffer for following Jesus. That's the way it is. And we must learn that. We must take that to heart now because it's coming. If we're going to, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Remember what that means. It means the gates of hell won't keep us out. If we're going to follow, if Jesus is going to kick in the gates and we're going to follow into hell through him to take back what Satan stole, then guess what? We're going to be, we've got to be ready for battle, but it's going to be suffering. It's going to tell some suffering, so we've got to get ready for it. And then Timothy says, no soldier gets entangled, Paul says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Another military metaphor, okay? In times of war, we don't... We can't be, you can't be unfocused in a time of war. You can't be distracted in a time of war because it's too costly, right? And so during war times, not just on the battlefield, but even on the home front, right? You have rationing, you have couponing. You can only have so much of this at so much time. Why? Because we have to sacrifice at home so that the necessary resources that we have here will be available to those on the front line where the battle is raging. So no matter what part you play on the battlefield, there's always sacrifice. There's always suffering, and there always must be a focus. I have to stay focused. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits because his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. We have one mission in life, and that is to please God. That's it. That's all we have to do is please God. And when you want to please God, when you have a mission in life, Whatever that mission is, you, we have the responsibility to, to push out the other things in our life that would distract us from that mission. We have to stay focused. If, if, if people stay focused during war because they want to preserve life and liberty, then how much more is at stake in a spiritual battle? Eternal life 
and spiritual freedom. The stakes are infinitely higher. So we have to stay focused and we have to be ready to suffer. The next metaphor is the one of, of competition of an athlete. An athlete is not crowned, he says, unless he competes according to the rules. <clears throat> To win the game, you must play by the rules. You see, if you cheat, you didn't really win, right? Even if you won because you cheated, if you cheated, you didn't really win because you didn't play by the rules. Okay? Following Jesus comes with clear guidelines, right? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me, right? Clear guidelines to follow Jesus. And so in addition to a battle, uh, the, the Christian life is like a race. It's like a race. Our life is like a race. Now, the glorious thing about the race is that it's, it's, a, it's, a, not a, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, right? And everybody who crosses the finish line gets a crown. Okay? Now, some will receive bigger crowns than others, but if you cross the finish line, you get a crown. The only thing you really got to be worried about is not making it to the not finishing. That's something you really got to be worried about. Not finishing it. You're not crowned unless you compete according to the rules. And so, and so we have to make it to the finish line, and we have to play by the rules. We have to trust and obey Christ. You cannot pursue God's ends with Satan's methods. You just can't. So just because the world out there treats you one way, you can't treat them the same way in response. Why? Because you can't, you can't win, you can't play by, you can't uh, pursue God's ends with Satan's methods. Paul said, do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. We have to, to make it to the finish line. And then the final metaphor is this. He says, it's the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. This final metaphor is an appeal to work hard, right? Little labor, little reward. Much labor, much reward. The more you sow, the more you'll reap. And so the final part of Paul's rule book here is that we must work hard, right? Farming is, a, farming is a long game, okay? You have to sow, you have to fertilize, you have to water, then you have to wait. But if you're patient and you work hard, then you reap much more than you sow. Much more than you sow. And the one who works the hardest should have the first share of the crops. And so the Christian life is one of hard work. And so what these metaphors mean is that we must fight, run, and work so as to win the victory, finish the race, obtain the greatest share of the crops that we can. It will be costly. It will be battle. We'll have to follow the rules, even if it seems like nobody else is. We'll have to stay focused committing to do God's will, God's way, knowing this, that as we do the hard work of everyday disciple-making, we will reap infinitely more than we could possibly imagine. You know, talking about discipleship groups, if you haven't signed up, it's on the wall there. The sign-up sheet's on, taped on the wall there in the back of the church. The goal of these discipleship groups is to meet for a year and then each group at least split off once per year. If we start with four groups and then the next year there's eight groups, the next year there's 16 groups, and next year there's 32 groups, and next year there's 64 groups, 128 groups, 256 groups, 512 groups, 1,024 groups, in 10 years, that's 2,048 that's groups. And that the bare minimum of three people per group, that's over 6,000 people in a discipleship group. Well, you say, Pastor, I don't see 6,000 people here. Well, let's go fishing. What if 6,000 people in Dodge County started taking their faith seriously and, meet it, and started meeting together with other Christians every week? I, I tell you, this county wouldn't be the same. And you know what? Let's say, let's say over that time period, it's only, you know, a fourth overall as effective as it could be. That's still 500 groups. 
1,500 people. That's the power of discipleship. That's the power of multiplication, right? That's the power of when it's been passed on to me, I pass it on to somebody else, okay? So we must pass on the treasure. We must play by the rules. And finally, we must persevere for the elect. Verse 8, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, offspring of David, as preached in my gospel, for which I am suffering, bound with chains as a criminal, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. And so Paul concludes here with this emotionally charged appeal to Timothy. Okay, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, offspring of David, is preached in my gospel. Okay? So Paul urges Timothy, you have to remember the truth. Remember the core truth of the gospel. Jesus Christ, he's risen from the dead. That's the core truth of Christianity. That's next week we're going to celebrate that in a special way. Why? Because the resurrection changes everything. It literally changes everything. Think about it. Seriously, think about it. If, if a man has been risen from the dead, if a man has been raised from the dead, that changes the entire way you have to look at reality. Right? You think you understand that? You can't just go on same old, same old. If a man has been risen from the dead, that means there is something at work in the world beyond you and me. And that being, that God has a plan and a purpose for our lives. The resurrection changes everything. Remember that, Timothy. Remember the gospel. For which I am suffering, Paul says, bound with chains as a criminal. Paul is literally in prison as he's writing this, right? And he says that he's bound with chains as a criminal. But now just, now just wait now, because before you think that Paul is about to throw himself a pity party for all the suffering that he did for Jesus, which, by the way, was a lot. He suffered a lot for Jesus. Shipwrecked, robbed, uh, uh, imprisoned multiple times, beatings with rods on his back multiple times for Jesus. Okay? But he's not about to throw himself a pity party. He says, for which, I'm, for which I'm bound with chains as a criminal, but, but the word of God is not bound. You see what Paul is saying? You can lock me up, but you can't lock the gospel up. Jails, gulags, concentration camps can't lock up the gospel. There's only one thing that can lock up the gospel. And that, are Christ, that is Christians who are too afraid to suffer for it. That's the only thing that can lock up the gospel. The word of God is not bound. You know, in mission, in mission um, talk, we um, talk uh, about what they call closed countries. That is countries where it's, it's illegal to share the gospel. But somebody quipped one time, they said, there's really no such thing as a closed country. There's only countries where you may not live to share the gospel twice. But there's really no such thing as a closed country. Paul was bound with chains as a criminal, but you know what kept him going? Because it didn't matter what they did to him. They could lock him up all day, but they couldn't lock up the gospel. The gospel cannot be stopped. The only danger for the church is when Christians start loving the world so much that they become too afraid to suffer for the gospel's sake. Paul would not have this. He wouldn't have it for Timothy, and he wouldn't have it for us. That's why he tells Timothy, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, right? If you're in a war, do you complain that you suffer? No. no. Why? Because everybody's suffering. Everybody who gets in the battle for Jesus is going to have wounds. We're going to share our suffering together for Jesus, okay? We're going to share it together. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to be ashamed. And then Paul says this, and this is hugely important, and with this we'll be done. Verse 10, he says, Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Because the word of God cannot be bound, Paul is not going to let anything, even imprisonment, stop him from preaching Christ and charging him for others to do the same. And then we have this great, this great motivating statement. I endure everything for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Now think about that for a second, because that's a hugely important phrase. And I think it's one of the most important verses to understand the tension 
the tension between divine sovereignty and human responsibility in salvation. Okay? The elect means chosen. That's what the word means. It's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. So, so the question then is this. If God's people are chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, why do we need to do anything about their salvation? And that's the question that some people ask. But I just want to suggest to you this morning that if you ask that question, it's because you haven't really considered Paul's logic in this verse, the, the logic of the Bible uh, concerning these issues. Why, why do we need to be concerned about people's salvation if those who are going to be saved are going to be saved. This is why, and we already answered the question earlier. Because God uses means to accomplish his ends. God uses means to accomplish his ends. It is through the preaching of the gospel and the suffering for the sake of Christ that God is going to save his elect. God's going to do it no matter what. But he's going to do it through his people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. We are God's hammer to pound in the nails. Election, then, is not a reason why we shouldn't share the gospel. Election is the most important reason why we should share the gospel. Why? Because those people that you stand next to in line at the store, those people whose doors we knocked on yesterday, those people who live across the street, guess what? It's not a matter of if. God is going to save some of them. The question is, are you going to be part of it or not? Let me, let me ask you a question. If me and you were standing by a fish pond, and I was a prophet, I'm not a prophet, but let's, I was a prophet, you know I'm a prophet. I'm a prophet of God. Me and you are standing by a fish pond, and I say, I point to that pond, and I say, a world record largemouth bass is going to be caught out of that fish pond today. And then I turn around and walk away. You stand by the edge of the pond, and you look around, and there's just you. Let me tell you something. Will the fact that I told you that a world-class world ba uh, largemouth bass is going to be caught out of that pond, does the fact that I told you that give you encouragement to not go fishing? Or will you say, hmm, fish is going to be caught, huh? Maybe I should go fishing. You see what I'm saying? You tracking with me? If I tell you something's going to happen... Well, then maybe you should get on board with it so that you'll be part of what's happening, right? God uses means to accomplish his ends. Paul did not suffer in prison and get beat by rods and get shipwrecked on the hope that somebody might be saved. Paul went to prison gladly because he knew that through his suffering, people would be saved. It wasn't a question. That was the only thing that gave him the strength. He... Think about it. If you, if, you weren't, if you weren't sure that your suffering was going to do anything, how could you keep doing it? But if you were sure beyond a shadow of a doubt that your suffering, God was going to use it to save people, then guess what? Nothing could stop you from suffering because God is going to use it. So what does that mean? It means this. It means fish out there are going to be caught no matter what. So I say... Let's go fishing. Let's go fishing. We pass on the treasure. We play by the rules. We persevere for the sake of the elect. Paul says, I endure everything, everything for the sake of the elect, that they too may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So as I close this morning... This is the invitation. The first invitation is for those who have yet to surrender to Jesus Christ. 
And I'm telling you, if you're listening to this sermon this morning, that's because God wanted you to listen to this sermon this morning. And so if you're in here, if you're watching online and you say, I don't know Jesus Christ, well, guess what? That's the Holy Spirit of God working in your heart. And so guess what? God uses means to accomplish his end. So if God is speaking to your heart right now, and you know in your heart of hearts that it's true, then just believe. Believe. Say, Jesus, forgive me. Jesus, save me. Jesus, change me. And he will. And the, and the, the next invitation is this. Church, let us be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He woke us up this morning. He can use us to make disciples. Fish will be caught, so let's go fishing. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can be a tool in your hands. And that's, Lord Jesus, that's all we want to be. We know that we can't do it, but Lord, if you pick us up and you hold us in your hand to do something, nothing's going to stop you from doing what you want to do. You can use the, the, the tools in the worst shape to create the most beautiful things. And so, Lord Jesus, we pray that you would use us. We pray that you would change us. Lord Jesus, I pray for this community. I pray, God, that you would just do something beyond all that we could ask or imagine. I pray, God, that we would see people radically transformed by the gospel of your grace. And God, I pray that you would use us to do it. So help us, Lord, be faithful and obedient to you. And we'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The altar is open. However the Lord has spoken to you, this is a great time to respond. If you'd like to talk more about how you can follow Jesus Christ, I'd be glad to do that. If there's something you just want to leave here at the altar, please respond however the Lord has spoken. Let's stand as we sing. Don't forget all of the sign-up list, uh, some on the back wall, some uh, on the table in the back. Next Sunday, sunrise service, 7 o'clock. Uh, we would like a head count for the sunrise service so we can prepare for the food. Uh, and then, we're again, we're doing two services, one at 9.15 and one at uh, 10.45. The sign-up sheet is for that back there also. Um, Anything else on your hearts and minds this morning? Okay. Thank y'all. We look forward to, to seeing y'all on Easter Sunday. Bring someone with you. Uh, bring somebody to say, come. We got, we got some stuff going on at Cottondale. We just want you to come be a part of. And, uh, and y'all be in prayer for the message, for the song service, that God will just move in a mighty way on Easter Sunday and the things that we have to be thankful for. Yeah, so I get yeah, so y'all be seated. I'm just gonna mention this real quickly. Um, so, th part of the teams and stuff that we've been working on, um, uh, just so you'll be aware of some of the the differences that are gonna be here on Easter Sunday, and and Lord willing, willing following that as well, is that 
when, I, when I've been saying Welcome Center team, if you haven't already, you could peek into the fellowship hall. We're putting together a Welcome Center in there that is going to kind of act as our place where we can greet and welcome people on Sunday morning. So beginning next Sunday, I know people are creatures of habit, and you know, y'all don't like the pastor trying to break your habits, but I'm just going to nudge you a little bit. When y'all come to the church, get here a little bit earlier than usual, a little bit earlier than usual, and y'all, y'all come back here in the Welcome Center and have a cup of coffee and a donut. And y'all get here and y'all fellowship and talk a little bit before the service gets going. And th- that's going to be a place, too, where we can direct our guests so that when guests come, they can uh, just enjoy a little bit of fellowship with one another, a cup of coffee and a donut. So that's going to be next week. There's going to be some signs up. So just think about that. Plan, plan uh, that a little bit more. And we're going to try to start directing people that way. Of course, if you have health issues and can't do stairs well, of course you're welcome to come into the back. But we'd like to try to start maybe entering through the fellowship hall and just enjoying a time of fellowship, coffee, donuts with one another, and just kind of create an inviting place uh, for our guests. And as well, I mean, I don't have to teach y'all how to fellowship. Y'all know how to do that. But I think it'll be a sweet addition to our, our morning worship routine. And so that's just one new thing that we have going on. Okay, so that, that's the, the only thing left I wanted to share. And um, Brother Chris, would you mind closing us with a word of prayer this morning? Amen. Amen. Thank you.